Well, here's another cute little endearing quality that I always talk about. Uh, psychoanalysis, whenever it realizes that one of its diagnoses is obsolete, they have to reshuffle their terminology. It's part of the power of jargon, right? They don't admit the failure necessarily. They come together, they have a consensus, and they say, the term we've been using for the past 70 years is now obsolete. Well, the term hysteria became kind of outlawed in psychoanalytic discourse in 1950 because it was considered to be just too inaccurate, vague, an umbrella concept. Basically any physical disorder could be considered a hysterical one, right? Uh, that didn't have any clear physical causality. So meaning if you came and you had some strange physical ailment and they could not find any reason materially in your body for what was causing it, you could call it hysteria. Well, obviously they said there's no precision in that type of thing. So they got rid of it in 1952. It might interest you that, that's the DSM-5, by the way, that, uh, that excommunicated the term. The DSM-5, most likely in the next two years, will omit the word schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is now being abandoned by psych, uh, psychology, uh, increasingly for the term dissociative disorders, which they feel are more precise. You want a little uh, trick from someone who watches these things carefully? It's not more precise. It's just new vocabulary and more discourse to try and cover up the illusion of the fact that they didn't, they weren't able to encapsulate schizophrenia, okay? Um, and I told you mania has become kind of a useless subcomponent of any number of other psychic sort of things. So you can be manic and be schizophrenic. You can be, and, and they just sort of assign it to you. So the same thing happens. So the new term, boys and girls that we have to learn in psychoanalysis is no longer hysteria. They call it conversion disorder now, okay? It's a nice little qualification. Let's read what the DSM-5 says about conversion disorder. This is how it's defined. Conversion disorder, also known as functional neurological symptom disorder, is a psychological condition that causes symptoms that appear to be neurological, such as paralysis, speech impairment, or tremors, but with no obvious or known organic causes. That's what we just said. In the past, these events were often referred to as hysterical blindness or hysterical paralysis. So this is quite literally someone walks into the doctor's office and says, I went blind. And they check the eyes and the eyes are fully functional. There's no retinal damage, there's no tears, there's no anything to justify it. It's a purely psychological uh, uh, dilemma or, or hysterical paralysis or any number of things. You can't talk all of a sudden, right? And actually, again, to his immense credit, Freud was the one who diagnosed it as a neurological disorder that is linked to all kinds of anxiety. Usually, usually it's not a traumatic event that triggers it. It can be. It can be a physical or emotional tra trauma, but more often it's the accumulation of restless energy that's caused by, by, and we'll get into this. Freud doesn't think it's traumas, he thinks it's drives. And that's what makes hysteria so beautiful to deal with too. These are the primordial drives getting their revenge. This is lust, aggression, survival, right? Consumption, hatred. These are those tree trunks in the brain stem. That, uh, that are ferociously trying to claw at the surface. When the superego too violently cages them, it can do something to your internal system, like switch the lights off in your eyes, right? Almost like a lid that's not able to keep this leaking, bubbling cauldron from going over. So the fact that Freud, whether he's right or not, it's a fascinating story he's telling, that this is not linked to some experiential trauma. This is linked to the revenge of ancestral drives and the failure of the social world, the superego, the real, to be able to maintain them. And so they're lashing out. So anyway, conversion disorder is a relatively rare mental illness with two out of five out of two to five out of 100,000 people reporting symptoms per year. By the way, even that statistic is two to five uh, when you're talking about only two or five, is a massive fluctuation. Right? You're talking about over two, about 200 uh, percent error there. Right? Two or five people out of 100,000. 
Uh, it is categorized as a type of somatic symptom disorder. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5, the leading di diagnostic guide for the mental health profession. There is typically a sudden onset of symptoms, this is talking about hysteria or conversion disorder, that affect voluntary motor or sensory function. And these symptoms can disappear just as suddenly without any physiological reason. Okay, this is absolutely awesome. We're gonna get into this because what is unique to hysteria, two things. One, they can make the voluntary involuntary. And that's one of the formative ways that we establish identity. Like you accept at a young age that sneezing is involuntary for the most part. Coughing can be involuntary. Bleeding is involuntary. But then you compensate for that mentally and you give yourself some delusion of control over your universe by saying, but still like 90% of other things I do are supposedly voluntary. Now you're all super smart and you know that free will and consciousness is a whole mess of tangled wires and it's not as easy as that. But that's what we tell ourselves, the lullaby that we tell ourselves. Well, hysteria alone has the capacity to turn your voluntary motor or sensory functions involuntary, okay? Um, and we're not even talking about, we just talked about the negative ones. It can make you go blind. But what if it could make you see more precisely, like a cyclops? And by the way, I give you evidence that it can. In many instances, I gave you the hysterical strength example of mothers who typically, again, it is ascribed to mothers in that regard, but there are other examples of that. So there are ways in which it can also enhance uh, and expand motor and sensory functions, but again, involuntarily. Or it's only still involuntary because we haven't figured out a way or we haven't devoted serious consideration to how you could turn them voluntary, how you could learn and adapt to them. But anyway, and what distinguishes it is that hysteria disappears just as suddenly as it arrives. So whereas mania and schizophrenia and other ones are lifelong conditions, they're kind of considered innate, these sort of sweep into town, blanket things in their own mist, and then suddenly alleviate themselves without any rhyme or reason. Isn't it great that uh, how much of the DSM-5, which is a definitional and diagrammatic manual, keeps saying without any physiological reason or without any reason? It's a kind of cool paradox of, of, uh, you know, of, of writing a manual about something you claim you have no way of understanding. Yeah, episodes of mass hysteria in the world from, from my forthcoming work. First, uh, the historical dancing plague. Okay, this was, this was called choreomania, but it's a hysterical thing. Those episodes of spontaneously gesticulating crowds of thousands that swarmed the European countryside from 1300 to 1600. This is really interesting. Thousands of people would just start to and it's prone to long bouts of uncontrolled ecstatic jumping, wobbling, or lurching, attributed to such varying biological causes as ergot poisoning, hereditary and idiopathic disease, like epilepsy, typhus, encephalitis. None of those are correct, by the way. And to the lesser known tarantism, that's a cool one, of the tarantella dance. Yes, there were physicians of the time who believed that victims had ingested tarantula venom, and or that they had practice the Italian Tarantella dance, which caused them to have a perpetual dancing hysteria. Attributed sociopolitically, this is the most more serious scholarly academics, attributed sociopolitically to an extreme traumatic reaction to the Black Death, that was the plague, generalized poverty and totalitarian rule. I don't know again why all my Iranian friends aren't in uh, hysterical dancing states then because they're dealing with that constantly. I, again, remember that miraculous contingency that doesn't afford these nice deterministic causalities, like, well, extreme poverty, uh, plague, kind of, and totalitarianism leads to mass hysteria dancing. Not quite. Attributed theologically to cursing by being cursed by angry saints or spirits or demons, and for which later psychoanalysts themselves achieved no consensus, but to simply rename the condition in multiple descriptively unhelpful ways as mass hysteria or psychogenic illness, epidemic dancing, collective mental disorder, and choreomania. No shortage of labels. Yes, these incidents of mad dancing have their own place in the annals, those of an impalpable caress that is at once an interdiction and dooms the activation of its own. Okay, so that was the first one, is you can look back at that dancing 
dancing plague, and you can see these really interesting episodes of mass hysteria. The second, in the southern Bosnian city of Međugorje lies a Christian pilgrimage site where 40 years ago, 1981, six village children claimed to receive visions from the Virgin Mary. But they went up on a mountain and they saw a vision of her appear. Who to this day, people go there in pilgrimage, supposedly sends enigmatic reports to three of the now adult vessels at certain times of the month in the shape of fractal, fractal images or messages. These nine secrets are believed to be her final apparitions on earth before the apocalypse and many visitors to this destination. By the way, you can go Google it. There are tours to Medjugorje if you'd like to go. And many visitors to this destination have also claimed to experience supernatural optical signs, such as the sun careening through the sky or shadow crosses appearing in their palms. Psychoanalytic explanations of Medjugorje, yes, a bunch of psychologists have gone there to interview the children over time, the six children who claim to see the Virgin Mary and who monthly receive messages from her. Psychoanalytic explanations of Medjugorje have ranged from theories of the children suffering Oedipal ordeals. So this is what I love. One of the girls of the six, her father had just, or no, her mother had just died. So the psychologist shows up and in their professional diagnosis says, obviously it's a projection of the lack of the mother. Okay, that's great. What about the other five, Sherlock? That explains, you know, possibly her. All right. Anyway, Oedipal is to auto-hypnosis and auto-apparitional syndromes. And the child seers have even been subjected to multiple electro-oculogram readings to ascertain the cause of their prolonged collective psychokinesis, which is to say an influence on physical subjects and objects without physical energy, meaning that there is no Virgin Mary in material reality, but she continues to exert influence on them from some transcendent in existence sphere. That's psychokinesis, right? But what consistently baffles, I love this. I swear I've spent hours reading this research. What consistently baffles such subject-centered investigations time and again is the high degree of synchronism across these visionary instances. Okay, what is this is a fancy way of me saying this. They went and they studied the children while they recounted what the visions are like while they're having the visions and it, terrifies them to discover that they have almost identical frequencies of reaction time, speed, motion, facial expression, and eye blinking patterns. And they're in different houses in the village. You and I and Romulo and, and, and Andrew and Heather and I could spend years trying to perfect synchronicity of eye blinking patterns in a conspiratorial dramatic production, and we wouldn't be able to pull it off. Never mind six kids for 30 years.